Hey, it's Thursday, January 5th. Yesterday I was able to rivet the stiffeners onto the right elevator. Today I'm gonna to work on riveting the stiffeners onto the left elevator. And I'm gonna give you a really quick description of what exactly that is. Um, before I started this, I, I watched videos and I did some reading, but everything was still brand new to me. So I figure maybe some of the people who are watching this also are completely unfamiliar with the process of uh, building an airplane or, or working with sheet metal or anything like that. So when riveting the skins onto the, um, the elevators, they lay nice and flat, which means that you can use a technique called back riveting, which is pretty much maybe the easiest way to set rivets. These are thousands probably of teeny tiny little aluminum rivets that are used um, all over the airplane to um, hold the, attach the skins to the spars and the ribs and, and stiffeners and whatnot. Um, these ones are um, countersunk, which is what you want on the surface of the airplane. I don't know if you can see that, but they've got a countersunk or head so that they fit flush when you dimple the skins or the surfaces that they're going into so that it doesn't disturb the airflow over the top. But these are teeny tiny. This is a 3 30 seconds uh, diameter shank on this. Uh, the way that we describe a rivet is that you have a manufactured head, the part that comes from the factory that way, and then a shop head, which is the part that you create in the shop when you're driving or setting the rivets. The whole point of the rivet is to hold two pieces of metal together or more, perhaps. This is a piece of scrap. I'm going to change the camera here a little bit. This is just a piece of scrap for trying things out on. There's no real um, logic behind the way that it's put together, except that if I want to practice drilling some holes, uh, making some dimples or trying to figure out a dimple size for a particular size fitting, um, if I want to practice setting a flush rivet right here. This was made using uh, back riveting. So what back riveting is, is sort of riveting backwards. Ordinarily, I just showed you a rivet. Um, here's a rivet that is set for back riveting. Ordinarily, you would apply the, the ordinarily, sorry, this is a rivet that has been set up for back riveting. So normally when you're driving rivets, the rivet gun is applied to the, the factory head and a bucking bar, like a heavy piece of tungsten, is held on this side to allow the force of the, um, of the rivet gun to squash that head down and make something similar to that right there. Back riveting is doing it in reverse. You use a back riveting plate, heavy steel plate, and you set your skin down, in this case the skin, with the rivets, the, the shop head facing upward, and you would actually apply using a, a special head for the um, rivet gun from this side and, and drive from this side. Anyways, that's what I'm gonna be doing today. That's what I did yesterday. And honestly, any place where it's practical to do that, that's um, a really easy way to get really simple results. So anyways, that's what we're doing today. Stay tuned for some Keystone Cop time-lapse. All right, we are back at it and it looks like I'm getting ready to do some back riveting here. So what I'm doing here is placing all of the rivets into the skins and then using some hockey tape, um, not like the kind you put in your stick, but for tying up shin pads, um, using that to hold the rivets in place and then um, riveting carefully over the top of the back rivet plate that I showed you earlier. And then of course, using those pieces of two by four to keep the ends from flopping down on themselves. What you see in the foreground, that's what will ultimately be the trim tab that will go in that space, but it's gonna keep flopping around until you eventually get the trim tab star, uh, spar and the skeleton uh, installed. Back riveting um, 
but like I mentioned earlier, uh, mentioned earlier, is a pretty simple um, process once you get the hang of it and gives you pretty consistent results. Um, and then also in the foreground there next to that little piece of two by four, that is the trim motor access plate, the inside of it where the trim uh, motor will mount to. Um, and I think in here, yeah, I went ahead and got that um, riveted on as well. Later on, I'll give you a little tip that I have that I wish I had done with respect to that when it comes to mounting the the nut plates there that will hold the the access plate over that opening. Uh, right now, just um, working on some parts uh, for the skeleton. Um, the spar has uh, a couple of plates on it um, that nest down inside the web of the spar. So you need to um, break the edges of the break the edges of those so they don't interfere with um, the the flange, like the transition to the flange of the spar itself. So that's what I was doing on the Scotch Bright wheel, and then um, getting those cleat coat in place, uh, match drilled, and let's see here. No, I guess I was just cleaning them up. Those actually mount on the on the outside of the spar, but those are going to hold the big nut plates that the rod and bearings thread into. So now I'm setting up the bending break, um, and I'm going to try to work on the bend of uh, the right elevator, uh, try to get close to that angle where it sort of relaxes down onto the ribs. Um, what you see me do in the background is I have a piece of eighth inch steel rod. Um, I think I got it from Harbor Freight and or tractor supply that I will put down in the crease um, just to prevent uh, hopefully overbending. So I, I tuck it down in there and I hold it with a little piece of butyl. This is the right elevator. Um, kind of flipped over because if you think about it, this is the trailing edge. So the skinny end would be skinny end would be on this side. Um, but top, bottom, that doesn't really matter for what I'm doing here. Um, it's time for me before I do anything else on this elevator to uh, bend the final angle, which this root rib right here, you can see how tight that angle is compared to where we're at right now. And I'm hesitant to go too aggressively with this um, bending break. That's what this is. It's uh, two sections of two by eight um, with heavy duty door hinges here. And then um, I've got it mounted um, with some long bolts and some wing nuts. Do to do, I got it mounted on there. Um, to keep the bend nice and straight and have a good surface to do it with. So this comes up like this and then a ton of force is used to work that bend down. I just uh, posted a message in my, uh, the builder Slack group to ask how close in, in a relaxed state like it is now, how close does it need to be to this final bend? Because obviously once you clico everything together, it's going to pull it in and it can if from this point, it doesn't take very much uh, force to to hold it down there. But uh, I don't want to get too aggressive with the bending right now. I think the answer is going to be that it actually has to be very close from some other things that I've read. Um, eh, people say that it should basically just lay on the ribs. Yeah. Anyways, I'm not too crazy about getting too aggressive bending this stuff until somebody tells me specifically, yeah, it's okay. All right, that's it. No more bending until I get uh, a clearer answer as to how far that needs to go. So I'm moving on to working on the uh, counterweight assembly. Um, let me show you a picture. In the bottom right of the exploded isometric view, you'll see a jumble of parts that I'll be working on here and into the next day. You have an end rib um, that gets backed up to a counterbalance rib the counterweight itself, and then a counterweight skin that sort of ties it all together. And then ultimately that will be uh, riveted to the end of the spar and the skin itself. 
Uh, so that's what you see me doing right here is just sort of fitting up um, the skeleton and loosely putting together that assembly. Uh, in the next video, I'll get into um, what needs to be done to that weight to make it um, correct for this side of the airplane, including uh, drilling through a pretty thick piece of lead, which turns into um, a bit of a challenge. Um, and, and then uh, a few weeks later, I'll have similar challenges and, and apparently didn't learn uh, from my mistakes the first time. Uh, but that's what you see going on right here is the, the counterweight is on the bottom resting on the table. And uh, I've got the two other pieces uh, sort of sandwiched around it. And uh, anyways, uh, that'll wrap it up for this one. Um, I think this is elevators part three, get into a little bit more of this tomorrow. I get a lot done at the beginning of January, then I leave. <laughs>